urinary tract calculi are stones that are found anywhere within the urinary tract. We use more specific terms to describe stones in specific locations. Nethrolithiasis refers to a stone that's found within the kidney, whereas urethrolithiasis refers to stones that lie within the ureters. Commonly, regardless of their location, stones tend to be referred to as a group called renal stones. Let's remind ourselves of some key anatomy. So here we have the kidney. And lying within the kidney, we have the renal pelvis. Urine is drained from the renal pelvis into the bladder via the ureters, which are thin tubes of smooth muscle. The most common anatomical locations where urinary tract stones are found are at three points along the urinary tract, where the urinary tract becomes its most narrow. Starting superiorly, the first location is the pelvi-ureteric junction, or the PUJ, where the renal pelvis and the ureters meet. Then moving inferiorly, the next common location to find a stone is in the distal ureter at the point at which it narrows as it crosses the pelvic brim. The pelvic brim, as you can see, is the edge of the pelvic inlet and marks the opening into the lesser pelvis in which we find the urinary bladder. And the final common location for urinary tract stones to develop is at the point where the ureter enters the bladder and we refer to this as the vesico-ureteric junction, or VUJ. As these three locations are the most narrowed points of the urinary tract, it means that if stones do develop and are of large enough size to become lodged, then it's typically at these three points that they're going to do so. Urinary tract calculi are pretty common, affecting approximately 5% of the population. The occurrence of stones is rare in very young and very old individuals. And in fact, the peak incidence is between the ages of 20 and 50. Urinary tract stones are significantly more common in the male population, with an incidence of three cases to every one female case. Also, they most commonly occur in Caucasian and Asian populations. Moving on to risk factors for the development of urinary tract calculi. These include environmental factors, for example, living in a hot climate and being in the summer months of the year, both of which can result in dehydration and the production of more concentrated and lower volume of urine. In terms of dietary risk factors, there's a higher risk of stone development with the Western diet particularly one that's high in animal protein and high in salt intake. Patients who have sedentary occupations and lifestyles are also at a higher risk of renal stone development. And finally, a family history of stones is a significant risk factor, with 25% of patients with renal stones having a positive family history of the condition. Urinary tract stones are most commonly made of calcium oxalate and uric acid. Uric acid stones are typically associated with the presence of obesity and metabolic syndrome, as well as the presence of urine with a more acidic pH. Struvite stones are a less common form of stone. They're made of magnesium ammonium phosphate and are usually related to the presence of infection so much so that people tend to refer to them as infection stones. Other rare types of stones include calcium phosphate and cysteine stones. Looking at why stones actually form, 
we can remember the three major factors for this by remembering the three S's. The first S stands for sepsis, or more specifically, patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections, such as proteus, which is associated with the formation of struvite stones. The next S is supersaturation. So essentially, when the patient has an increased urinary concentration of the specific stone-forming constituent, such as calcium or uric acid. And the third S refers to stasis. When there is an abnormal urinary tract or blockage that's preventing the normal drainage and flow of urine. So remembering the three S's will give you a simple way of recalling the major factors behind a urinary tract stone forming. Patients who have stones that remain in the kidneys themselves and have no associated complications tend to only complain of a dull ache and minimal symptoms. And often, these stones may be identified as incidental findings during imaging investigations for other non-related conditions. However, in patients with stones that lodge within the ureters, they typically present with a severe acute pain in their flanks that radiates down to the groin on the same side. Therefore, we can remember this classic presentation as pain that is loin to groin. The pain that the patient describes is usually a constant pain. However, it can also be colicky in nature. As well as pain, it's common for patients with urinary tract calculi to experience nausea and vomiting. And in some cases, they may also describe symptoms consistent with recurrent urinary tract infections. When we examine these patients, they are typically unable to get comfortable regardless of whatever position they adopt. And when we examine the abdomen of patients with urinary tract calculi, in non-complicated cases, palpation of the abdomen is usually unremarkable. However, in cases where the kidney is obstructed and infected, we may expect to elicit some tenderness over the renal angle. If the patient has a urinary tract infection, as well as a stone, then they may also demonstrate features of sepsis. The differential diagnoses for urinary tract calculi are pretty extensive. As with most cases of acute abdominal pain, we have to consider the possibility of acute appendicitis and also biliary conditions such as biliary colic or acute cholecystitis. Other key differentials include diverticulitis, urinary tract infections, and gynecological pathology such as pelvic inflammatory disease or ectopic pregnancy. An additional and really important differential diagnosis to always have in the back of our mind, especially in older patients with acute flank pain, is the presence of a symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysm or AAA as a rapid increase in the size of a AAA or a contained rupture of the aneurysm can present with symptoms which are very similar to those caused by a urinary tract stone. And therefore, obviously it's vital that we aim to identify and exclude the presence of a symptomatic AAA as soon as possible. The investigations that we can carry out in patients with presumed urinary tract calculi include urine tests, blood tests, and imaging. In terms of urine tests, the first investigation we should be doing is urinalysis with a urine dipstick. The key things that we should be looking for include the presence of microscopic hematuria, which would typically be present as a result of irritation of the urothelium of the ureters by the presence of the stone. In fact, in elderly patients with acute loin pain who do not have any evidence of microscopic hematuria on urine dipstick, this should make us highly suspicious that they do in fact have an alternative pathology that's causing their symptoms, in particular, a symptomatic AAA. The other things that we should be looking for on urine dipstick are leukocyte esterase and nitrites, which would indicate the presence of a urinary tract infection, and also looking at the pH of the urine 
as the presence of a more acidic urine predisposes the patient to the development of uric acid stones. If our initial urinalysis suggests the potential presence of infection, we should be sending the urine sample off for microscopy, culture and sensitivity, or M, C and S. This is important, as it can help us confirm the presence of an infection and also allow us to identify the particular microorganism that's present so that we can better tailor our antibiotic treatment. Moving on to blood investigations, we should be checking the patient's full blood count to look for an elevated white cell count or leukocytosis, which would be in keeping with the presence of infection, as would a raised CRP. We would also want to check the patient's creatinine to assess their renal function and also look at their electrolyte levels, particularly sodium and potassium. As we've previously mentioned, two of the main constituents of urinary tract stones are uric acid and calcium. Therefore, it's really important that we check the serum levels of these to identify those patients who have higher levels and therefore have a higher predisposition to the development of stones. In patients with stones, in whom we intend on undertaking some surgical or endoscopic intervention, we should be checking their coagulation in preparation for these procedures. Now moving on to imaging, we have several options that are available to us. The main investigation we can use is CTKUP or a CT scan of the kidneys, ureters and bladder. CTKUBs are a non-contrast enhanced CT scan, which means that they don't use any radio-opaque contrast. They are both highly sensitive and specific in demonstrating the presence of urinary tract stones, and this is why they are widely considered to be the first-line investigation in patients who present with presumed acute urinary tract calculi. An additional benefit of CTKUBs is that they can also reveal the presence of other pathologies, including appendicitis and a AAA. CTKUBs only involve a very small dose of radiation compared to other forms of CT imaging, and this means that their use may be considered in pregnant or pediatric patients. However, always be sure to review the policy of the hospital you're based in. Looking at this CTKUB, we can see, demonstrated nicely, the right kidney, and running inferiorly from the right kidney and renal pelvis, we can see the ureter. And there, sitting within the mid to proximal part of the ureter, we can see a stone. Now looking at this other CTKUB image, we can see the bladder sitting anteriorly and posterior to this, so positioned below it on the scan, we can see a urinary tract stone that's become lodged at the vesico ureteric junction, or VUJ. An alternative imaging modality to CTKUB is ultrasound. Ultrasound is useful, as it may also be able to identify alternative causes of the patient's pain, such as AAAs or gallstone disease. Additionally, it does not involve the use of any radiation. Hence, it's completely safe to be used in pregnant and pediatric patients. However, there are some issues of ultrasound that limit their use in the acute investigation of patients with urinary tract calculi. One is that it is not particularly good at demonstrating the presence of very small stones, typically those that are less than 5mm in diameter. Also, the accuracy of ultrasound is very much dependent on the skills and experience of the individual who's undertaken the scan, unlike CTKUBs, where the quality of the views is highly consistent and reproducible. Whilst the absence of radiation makes ultrasound completely safe for the use in pregnant patients, its reduced sensitivity and specificity means that we risk missing stones when compared to using CTKUB. An alternative imaging technique to be aware of that may be used in cases where we want to completely avoid radiation is an MRI scan, or specifically an MRI urogram. However, again we should note that MRI is less accurate than CTKUBs at showing the presence of urinary tract stones, and therefore we aren't going to discuss it in any more detail. The last imaging modality to be aware of 
and one that actually plays more of a role in monitoring the passage of confirmed stones in the outpatient setting is a plain x-ray film. Whilst these used to be used more commonly as an acute investigation, they have now been largely superseded by CTKUB, given its easy accessibility and diagnostic accuracy. When managing urinary tract calculi, there is a difference in how we treat patients who have an acute presentation to those patients with less acute but more persistent symptoms. We shall start by focusing on the management of the acute cases first. We can divide the acute management of patients with urinary tract calculi into medical management and interventional management. Given that patients with urinary tract stones typically have very intense pain, it's obviously important that we give them analgesia. This can be in the form of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as diclofenac or indomethacin, or we can consider the use of opiates, such as morphine or tramadol. As well as analgesia, we should also be giving the patient smooth muscle relaxants. For example, tamsulosin, which is an alpha-1 blocker, or nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. The reasons for giving smooth muscle relaxants is as an attempt to relax the smooth muscle wall of the ureter and any contracted tone, and therefore help dilate the lumen of the tract and encourage the stone to dislodge and pass spontaneously. In stones of a smaller nature, medical management is typically all that's required. In fact, 95% of stones which are 4 millimeters or smaller will pass spontaneously within 40 days of presentation. In patients who have a urinary tract stone that is causing both obstruction and infection, these should be regarded as a urological emergency and therefore should be managed in a slightly different way. In these patients, obstruction of the ureta by the lodged stone causes increased backflow pressure in the renal system, which is called hydronephrosis. And also, as a result of the stagnation of urine, this results in the concomitant presence of a UTI. Patients with obstructed infected renal systems can become critically unwell, and therefore it's vital that as well as commencing urgent IV antibiotics, we decompress the obstructed infected system as soon as possible. This is most commonly undertaken via the insertion of a nephrostomy which is a drainage tube that's inserted percutaneously under radiological guidance into the renal pelvis. Or, alternatively, we can drain the system by the endoscopic insertion of a ureter extent. Regardless of which intervention is opted for, the important thing is that we decompress the renal system and allow the drainage and control of the source of sepsis as soon as possible to allow the patient to recover. In terms of the definitive removal of stones in these patients, this should be delayed until the infection has completely cleared following a course of antimicrobial therapy. And we should discuss the various elective intervention options we have in the next part of this series. In patients with persistent urinary tract stones, but no obstruction or infection, and in whom medical management is unlikely to resolve the problem, they'll need to undergo elective intervention to remove the calculi. This can take the form of shockwave lithotripsy, ureterorenoscopy, or URS, or percutaneous netherolithotomy, or PCNL. Shockwave lithotripsy is the least invasive of our interventional therapies and involves the use of targeted high-energy sound waves that are created by a lithotripter machine to help break down stones that are lodged within the urinary tract. Given that shockwave lithotripsy is the least invasive of our interventions, it is often the preferred treatment in more straightforward cases. However, its effectiveness is reduced in cases involving larger stones, so typically those greater than 2 cm in diameter, in stones that are very hard and dense, and also in patients who are obese. 
Therefore, in these scenarios, we'd want to consider using one of the more invasive interventions. In ureterinoscopy, or URS, a flexible endoscope is inserted via the bladder and up into the ureter. The endoscope allows us to visualize the stone that's lodged within the ureter, and in the case of larger stones, allows to break up these stones through the use of a laser. The larger stone fragments that remain can then be removed by the endoscope, and the smaller fragments are left to be passed spontaneously. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy, or PCNL, is the most invasive of our interventional therapies, and therefore is typically reserved for the treatment of larger stones, for example, those greater than 2 cm, or in patients in whom other treatment modalities have been unsuccessful. In PCNL, a needle is inserted via the patient's side and into the renal pelvis. A guide wire is then inserted, followed by dilators and a sheath, which enables the introduction of the endoscope. The renal calluses, renal pelvis, and the proximal ureter can then be examined by the endoscope to look for the presence of any stones. And if any stones are identified, they can then be extracted with or without the use of any fragmentation. To summarize what we've covered in this tutorial series on urinary tract calculi, urinary tract calculi are a common surgical presentation and typically present with loin to groin pain. In older patients who present with these symptoms, it's important that we always consider the potential diagnosis of a symptomatic AAA. 95% of stones smaller than 4 mm will typically pass spontaneously with the use of conservative management. However, larger stones may need intervention to break them down or remove them completely. Lastly, urinary tract stones that cause obstruction and infection are a urological emergency, and they need urgent antibiotics and decompression of the obstructed system to control the source of sepsis and to prevent further clinical deterioration.